Hello, and welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. We continue with our in-depth study of First Thessalonians and are nearing the end of that book. Paul has been addressing here in our most recent classes the issues that were apparently raised uh, directly by the Thessalonian people uh, or <coughs> surfaced once Timothy returned. Today's lessons deal uh, deals with the challenge and peace associated with the eschatological end time events of Christ's return uh, called the parousia. So let's read this in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 verses 13 through chapter 5 verses 11. And I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this was declared to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of the command, with the archangels call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now concerning the time and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness. For that day to, su to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love for the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for a obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The early Christian church likely understood that Jesus Christ would return while all believers were still alive. Scholars are pretty in pretty good agreement to that. That return of Christ in Greek is the word parousia, which means anticipating a royal appearance. Many scholars suggest that, that likely some believers have died since Paul was there, Paul and Silas were there with them and before Christ is returned. So here it seems Paul is consoling them while at the same time teaching some critical theology in these verses that we just read. The address, he addresses them in a two-pronged question approach of what happens if you die before the parousia. And after they learn that then who goes first 
those living are those who, who have preceded them in death and have been resurrected seems to be the question there as you move into chapter 5. That sudden meeting in the cloud event is called by some Christians the rapture. We'll deal with it that term at the very end of our class today. Dr. Beverly Robert Gaventi at Baylor University in her comment states that this section of scripture presents special problems for interpretation by modern, especially by modern readers with a science-based mindset and those of the more liberal bent. Many people say this sounds more like a fairy tale than some critical theology uh, for peace and comfort. But she says again, as she does often, Paul was not writing to we moderns with a science-based mindset, but to people of his day and time that he had recently instructed. Most likely he had told them that the apocalyptic storyline of the Judeo-Christian belief of his time period is what they have as a background. And I might add, that storyline that Paul has is a little different from what we encountered in John's Revelation, book of Revelation. Paul opens here specifically addressing the uh, implications of Christ's anticipated end time return called the parousia uh, in Greek. That's the Greek term and that's the term that's there in, uh, in our Bibles in the Greek version which is the language that Paul is writing in. How can this promise still occur for those uh, believers who have already died in the faith before Christ returns is the question on the table. The order is the issue of timing and dating uh, in the proofs of when it actually occurs, which we'll deal with in chapter five as we move into chapter five at the end of this. But Paul makes it clear you are not to be ignorant of these points or this issue, but must understand that Christians are required to wait for that day without knowing when it will occur while living the ethical life that is God that God wills for you that's consistent with God's will until either you fall asleep meaning to die or Christians or, or Christ returns uh, this, this is essentially the answer that Paul gives them here. So, a few argue that this falling asleep concerns only those who were martyred Christians. After all, this has just been going on. But the majority of scholars strongly disagree with that conclusion. There is nothing in the Greek, they say, to suggest such a limit is imposed here nor is it implied here in the Greek. In our classroom discussion, uh, for those that are meeting in class, this may be a good issue for us to, to discuss is, is, and for you to think about, is what are some of the issues that were surfacing that may have caused these Thessalonians to have these concerns? Notice that Paul starts by referring to those around them in his rhetorical uh, approach, if we can say that here, or his uh, arguments with them. But scholars say the Greek is awkward, too ambiguous with the meaning of those around them. Uh, it's not quite clear who he's referring to. Is he referring to those within the church that do not believe they will be resurrected for salvation if they die before Christ returns? Or is he referring to those of other religions that have rejected the resurrection of the dead? The scholars generally lean towards the latter there, that, it, that he's referring to the outsiders. Because in verse 14, the very next verse there, he addresses the foundational uh, a foundational Christian belief uh, 
that Jesus died and was resurrected, and he will again return to collect the saints, both those who have died and those who still are still alive at that time are included in the event. Surely the apostles, the several scholars, surely the apostles, even though they were there for only a short time, would have taught such a concept very early in their uh, ministering missionary work with these people. Because it appears in early Christianity to be a very foundational concept. Several preaching scholars say we should not lose the point that Paul is also consoling them here by reminding them of the Christian hope. Those who believe in Jesus' death and resurrection also believe in the assurance that Jesus will return and God will unite his believers back with him. That consoling is why this scripture is so often cited uh, in Christian funerals. Very common. Very common. Notice verse 15's wording here. Paul is making it very clear that those who have died in the faith have precedence in the ascension order over those who remain alive at the end of time. At least in the procession. They're not they're brought up together, but the guys in the front of the line are those who have died and are resurrected. But also note what Paul does not say here, which causes a lot of confusion because people don't read this carefully. Notice what he does not say. He does not say, nor does he imply here, that those who are dead are already with Christ in heaven. As one scholar said, regardless of how much we may hope it is that way when our loved ones are lost, we cannot use Paul's writings here as defense for that common assumed belief among a lot of Christians. In verse 16 through 18, Paul gets more descriptive than normal concerning the return of, of Christ, that is, that Perusia, uh teaching that's there says Dr. Abraham Smith at uh, Southern Methodist University. He is vivid and terse in the apocalyptic drama, says Dr. Abraham Smith, uh, and he sets it in the Judeo-Christian apocalyptic images of Paul's time and 200 years before Paul, okay, when much of the apocrypha material is written. We see such language in Daniel and the apocrypha books of the Psalms of Solomon, uh, Enoch and Baruch, for example. Plus, of course, uh, certain a, a different version of it in the Revelation of John. That was in written that's in the New Testament and written 40 years after Paul here, maybe even more than 40 years. In the Greek, it appears as if Paul is telling it as a memorized poem or short story, something he's known well for a long time. His purpose for doing it, most say, is to provide assurance of hope among the Thessalonians as they grieve and fear for their salvation. The trumpet sound that's mentioned here uh, uh, some people go all over the board with this thing, uh, but most scholars say they believe that this is signaling the is he's using it to signal the actual arrival of a royal figure, Christ the royal figure, Christ the king, rather than as it's so often interpreted in the in especially the Old Testament as signaling a battle. <coughs> Excuse me. Several scholars argue that the believers, alive or resurrected, meet the Lord in the air means uh, that they're meeting him in heaven. This is not occurring in a earthly sphere, in the Greek. The words of there are not referring to the earth. 
This is not an earthly soil event in the Greek, several scholars point out. Moreover, Satan at this point still rules on earth in the apocalyptic uh, time sequence. So this event happens where Satan has no effect and Satan rules in the apocalyptic mindset that we covered so thoroughly in uh, the book of Revelation that we most recently studied. That the apocalyptic mindset is that Satan rules here on earth. It's only after Satan's put under control does he not rule here. And if this parousia is happening prior to the, re the removal of Satan. So most scholars say that based on that concept, this is a event occurring beyond you just looking up. This is not the same storyline that's found in the book of Revelation. Several preaching scholars point out that verse 18 clearly reflects that Paul recognizes the reality of grief at the time of a loss of loved ones in the faith. Even if they died knowing this hope and were sure of resurrection, there is still grieving. That hope is, however, an eschatological connected hope. It's to be fulfilled in a future time, not in the real time of death. So Paul urges them to encourage one another on a regular basis, but especially at this time of the loss, by sharing the story of what the future does hold. Dr. Gaventi says, it seems Paul try, is trying to place the, the comforting uh, here in appreciating what God has planned and what God is doing in the world order and so forth not on the individual case, but place your grieving into the big picture, is the way she puts it. It is a, that's a concept that the scholars say is there. That at the time of death, it's so easy to focus on your individual situation, but look at the big picture. It's kind of the way Paul is approaching it also. So there is comfort for those left behind with knowledge and hope that God has a final plan involving Christ and the believers, whether they're dead believers or whether they're still living at that time. As we move to those 11 verses in chapter 5, note that Paul shifts there uh, to these people's confusion concerning the timing of this event. Exactly when is it going to happen? But Paul resolves that quickly. He's very terse. You know very well we cannot predict the date. Instead, you need to understand it will come like a thief in the night while you are asleep and not on guard. So you must live an ethical life that fits God's will. So you will be ready for that day all the time, day or night sleeping or awake. It will happen on God's time schedule, not man's. Understand and get that point is clearly implied here in the Greek scholars say. He then uses the analogy of a soldier being always ready for the attack. Put on God's armor so that you are ready at all times is the concept. And I might add that in combat, uh, when you anticipate something or is maybe going to be happening or might happen, then you sleep, so-called sleep with all your gear on, your fighting gear on, your armor on. And it's a similar analogy that Paul is using here. You have to always be ready. So you don't take your armor, you don't take your material off and then lay down and go to sleep when the enemy is just across the road. No, you sleep on your gear. And that's the analogy that 
scholars say Paul is using here. You must be ready. And you must be ready how? By living an ethical life that is satisfying of God's will. Finally, a little on this confusion about the rapture. Note that word was not present in the Bible there where we read these verses. But it is used by Christians that hold to it when referring to those very scriptures that we read. However, the rapture was, the rapture concept, I, I prefer to call it, was not a historical Christian uh, concept or was not historically there in Christianity. Instead, it surfaced sometime in the uh, early 1800s, building through the, through the 1800s and early 1900s, and was not adopted by most Christian denominations. Uh, and is not adopted by most Christians worldwide. It is mainly in vogue among American evangelicals and combines a number of prophecies in the Bible and is not confined just to these words here in, in, in the first Thessalonians. There is much debate even among the people who hold to the rapture concept uh, as to what it really means. So with that, that, hopefully this gives you some idea of how the scholars look at these verses here at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of uh, chapter 5. And hopefully we'll see you again next week and you have a good week.